I thought uh, today we would uh, start out with the um, presentation title was on emotional intelligence. And uh, I'm also uh, going to emphasize, particularly in this program, because I noticed there's another emotional intelligence one coming up. I looked at the 11 titles we gave you some time ago. And uh, that one we can center more on aspects that we don't cover here. But I'm particularly going to cover the emotional health of children and adolescents, uh, because that is a significant issue. Uh, that is dramatically uh, increasing in regards to the problems throughout the world. So first of all, what is emotional intelligence? It's understanding your emotions and the emotions of others and responding to those emotions in a healthy way. Sounds pretty simple, but as we know, it's pretty uh, complex. And our behaviors powerfully influence our thoughts and emotions. This is why when people come to our program, our residential programs, in particular, we deal a lot with behavioral issues off the bat. In other words, um, we're going to change their behaviors to enhance their brain biochemistry. But it's our thoughts that cause our emotions and behavior. So we don't just improve the hardware of the brain through behaviors. We're actually going to rewire the brain in regards to the software. And the software has to do with our, net, with our automatic thoughts. These are like highways in the brain. And we've had some people come to our program and say, Dr. Nedley, I know you're an expert on brain biochemistry. I didn't mention before, but I did have a degree in biochemistry uh, and, uh, before I went to medical school. Uh, and uh, so I'm just here to get my biochemistry fixed. Uh, I don't need to go to counseling. My problems are real. Uh, but the counseling aspect of things can help us change unwanted, distorted thoughts that are not helpful. And when we start changing those, we can create new highways in the brain and we can start to get rid of our negative automatic thoughts. And when we do that, it improves brain chemistry. We'll talk about that. Uh, as well. So it's not just the behavioral aspect, the nutritional aspect. We also have to look at our thoughts. In particular, are they helpful and are they accurate? Aristotle mentioned many years ago there are many ways to demonstrate anger, and anyone can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not within everyone's power, and that is not easy. Well, I actually disagree with that last statement. Once you learn the principles of emotional intelligence, it is within everyone's power. And this is one of the big and uh, gratifying parts of our work. Uh, we started out trying to help mental disease, depression, anxiety, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, all these mental uh, challenges that we're dealing with today. But what we've noticed is as we improve those things or the principles that improve those things will also greatly enhance our emotional intelligence and all of us can learn those six things. And that gives us a significant advantage in many ways. Emotional intelligence contributes more to successful and enjoyable living than IQ does. And IQ is very important. That's our ability to learn, retain, and apply knowledge. And that's what most of academia is about. If you're going to school, uh, even when you're in first grade, you are learning. Uh, and you are trying to retain it and then trying to apply that knowledge. Uh, but emotional intelligence turns out to be far more important to learn uh, than the other aspects of academia. And since emotional intelligence is also learned rather than inherited, it can be improved upon. And this can make a dramatic difference uh, in our lives and even in our employment and in academics itself, as you'll see. So there are five components of emotional intelligence. The first one is knowing our emotions. That means to be able to not only precisely identify uh, the emotion that you're feeling, but also why you're feeling that way. 
And if the why is because someone just cut you off in traffic, you're not understanding your emotions. Because yes, that might have been the activating event, but it's your thoughts about being cut off in traffic in that way that are actually producing your emotions. And so we are not really aware of our, we don't have appropriate self-awareness until we are able to identify our thought-emotion connection. And when we can start doing that, then we are set up to improve the second aspect of emotional intelligence, and that is managing our emotions. People with low emotional intelligence are managed by their emotions. Moment by moment, day by day, they are being managed by their emotions. People with high emotional intelligence are managing those emotions. And this underscores something that the most quoted scientific researcher now in all the world states is the number one problem in all the world. The number one problem in all the world is not what the politicians talk about. I doubt, uh, I can tell you, I'm just guessing because in America, as you know, uh, it seems like American politics are learned around the world. Everywhere I go, everyone knows about what's happening in America with politics. And I have never heard the current president talk about the number one problem. I've never heard the past president talk about the number one problem. And Congress has never held a even committee discussion about the number one problem in all the world. They'll talk about all sorts of other problems, but they miss the number one problem in all the world. What is the number one problem in all the world? And by the way, they shouldn't miss it because the most quoted researcher says it is the number one problem. It's lack of comprehensive self-control. Lack of comprehensive self-control causes more problems by far than any other problem that you might try to discuss whether it be immigration, whether it be inflation, whether it be whatever uh, the, the discussion uh, tends to be. And this is something we can improve upon. We'll never be able to manage or uh, have self-control unless we're first able to manage our emotions. And we can't manage our emotions unless we are able to enhance our emotional intelligence. Recognizing emotions in others is the third aspect of emotional intelligence. It's not just about our emotions, it's also about our uh, relations with others called social intelligence. So managing relations with others. You can see why emotional intelligence is very important to your personal happiness because many issues and many, uh, a lack of, un or I should say lack of happiness or unhappiness has to do with poor relationships or even loneliness. And then the fifth aspect of emotional intelligence is motivating ourselves to achieve our goals. You can have a high IQ, in other words, you can have a high ability to learn, retain, and apply knowledge, but if you are not well motivated, you might not even have a high grade point average. You might actually be failing classes even though you're capable. And uh, that is due to low EQ. It's not due to low IQ. EQ is the emotional intelligence aspect of things. So we're focusing in on this presentation, particularly with children. Children can actually develop self-control. And studies show children with better self-control are actually more popular with other children, not less popular. And they score higher on SAT scores 10 years later. Now, in, a, in America, when you're in high school, you take a college entrance exam. It might be called SAT. There's another one called ACT. And a lot of um, high school students, to get into the best colleges and universities, study hard to do well on that test. Studies have shown the best predictor of how well you're going to do in high school is actually how much self-control you have at age six. Age six actually determines what your SAT or ACT score is going to be 10 years later. Because if you have high comprehensive self-control at age six, you're going to be well motivated and you're going to be able to learn better and you're going to do better on that test. Displaying self-control by age 11 
highly correlated with successful employment throughout participants' lives. Participants with low self-control experienced three times as many months of being unemployed over 22 years when compared with those with high self-control. Increasing emotional intelligence has been shown to effectively prevent or treat depression, phobias, and by the way, one of the phobias that's uh, significantly increasing among our young people today is called social phobia. And so many of them, they'd much rather text somebody than actually talk to them face to face because of this social phobia. And then another issue that we're seeing is uh, they'll call it social anxiety, but in reality, sometimes it's not social anxiety, it's called social appearance anxiety. Social appearance anxiety is that you fear that you're going to be ju judged negatively by others just when they see you and when you show up. And so, uh, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why that's dramatically increasing today. Obsessive compulsive disorder can be treated by enhancing emotional intelligence. Post-traumatic stress disorder and even the eating disorders of anorexia and bulimia. And addictions. Addictions now are at an all-time high throughout our world and we have seen this dramatic increase even in our program. It's hard to find someone, I shouldn't say hard to find, but maybe only 10% of the people that come through our depression and anxiety recovery program do not have an addiction. Uh, and so addictions can change our brain chemistry uh, adversely, whether it's a substance addiction or a non-substance addiction. Uh, it also can improve or prevent uh, violence against family and others. This was one of the reasons why I was asked to develop this curriculum for children that we're going to be talking about on enhancing emotional intelligence. It was actually the judicial system that asked me to develop it because of the increase in violence that's occurring. Uh, violence is also a sign of low emotional intelligence, an extreme sign of low emotional intelligence. And of course, it can also effectively prevent or treat relationship breakups. Obviously, if we have higher emotional intelligence, we're much more likely to have good, solid, positive relationships. But if there is a relationship breakup, how are we going to handle that? In today's world, uh, young people often, as a result of a breakup, are thinking of killing themselves, and many suicides actually occur as a result of a breakup. And so the breakup might have been caused by low emotional intelligence, but even lower emotional intelligence will cause someone to end their life as a result of that breakup. Increasing emotional intelligence fortunately also helps normal people. It helps us to think clearer, communicate more effectively. It fosters unity in group settings. It reduces polarizing statements. All the polarizing statements you see in politics today is actually due to the low emotional intelligence of the politicians. So it's not just a problem with children and adolescents. Uh, in fact, if you're wondering why uh, older adults uh, particularly those in their 70s and 80s that are in politics are acting like children and adolescents. It actually has to do with their emotional intelligence. Many people have told us that they wish every politician would go through our emotional intelligence training before they ran for office. Uh, it promotes a happier life and all of this is accomplished without compromise or sacrificing the truth. One of the bedrock principles of emotional intelligence is what is accurate, what is true. And uh, many times we think, well, that's going to divide people uh, because uh, not everyone's going to necessarily see the truth. But I can tell you this, if you put truth aside in order to have unity, that's a superficial unity that will not withstand any stress coming into the relationship. So a bedrock principle of unity is it has to be based on what is true and accurate. And if you have high emotional intelligence, not only are you thinking the truth, but you're going to actually be more uh, capable of helping others to see that as well in a loving way. So back to our uh, children. Uh, mental disorders in the, in the U.S. at least, and I think Australia is going to parallel this, ADHD Anxiety, behavioral problems, and depression are the most commonly diagnosed mental disorders in children. 
Uh, this was the years prior to COVID. The, the Centers of Disease Control in the U.S. has not yet released the post-COVID results, but back just those four years prior to COVID, 9.8% of U.S. children had already been diagnosed with ADHD. That's nine point, or, uh, 6 million of them. 9.4% with an anxiety disorder, already diagnosed. Behavioral problems, 8.9%, and depression, 4.4%. Now, this is significantly higher than what it used to be. Ever having been diagnosed with either anxiety or depression among children aged 6 to 17, this is those that are in kindergarten or first grade all the way through the 12th grade, which is, uh, I, is that similar here in Australia? Do you have 12 grades before you go to the university? Yes, so it's similar here. Increased from 5.4% in 2003 to 8% in 2007, 8.4% in 2011 and 2012. But then something happened rather significantly after that. Let's take a look at the one year prior to COVID, and this would be among our teenagers, or age 12 to 17. 15% had a major depressive episode that year. 36.7% had persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. These are our high school kids. Over one-third persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. 4.1% already were addicted to a substance and had a substance use disorder by the time they were 12 or 13 or 14. 1.6% had an alcohol use disorder. 3.2% had an illicit drug use disorder. 18.8% seriously considered attempting suicide that year. That's almost one in five of our teenagers seriously considering ending their own life. 15.7% of the total group actually made a suicide plan. And 8.9% or almost one in 10 of our high school students or teenagers tried to end their own life in just that year. And 2.5% of the total group made a suicide attempt actually requiring medical treatment where they ended in the emergency room or, or uh, having to stay in a hospital and, uh, and seriously uh, injuring themselves in order to uh, need the medical intervention that took place. Now this is so much worse than what it used to be. Depression, when I was growing up in America, depression was almost unheard of in younger people. In fact, the term for depression wasn't even there. The lay term for depression in America was called the midlife crisis. Uh, and uh, because people didn't even have it until they were middle, midlife or, or later. Uh, but uh, uh, depression, of course, is now the term for it. And uh, we see this great increase, particularly in among our young people. Behavioral, mental, and developmental disorders begin in early childhood. Uh, one in six U.S. children had a diagnosed mental behavioral developmental disorder. In ADHD, anxiety, and depression become more common with increased age. So uh, if you look on the screen here, uh, I'll, let me just explain a few things. We are going to be talking more about depression and anxiety. But you see on depression, these are the ages now at the bottom, three to five. Depression is almost unheard of. You can have a very bad childhood from five and under, and the five-year-old or under will not have depression. Why is that the case, even though they're raised in a terrible environment? Because they don't have the ability to reflect upon themselves. They need that frontal lobe to be larger. This is one of the reasons why animals, no matter how bad an animal's life is, they might have just been run over in severe pain. An animal will never consider taking their own life. You don't see suicides uh, in the animal kingdom no matter how bad that animal's life is, because their frontal lobe isn't large enough to be able to reflect upon themselves. 
So sometimes we call this the age of accountability. So by age six, you notice now, depression is starting because by age six and older, they're starting to be able to reflect upon themselves. So anyone who is considering suicide, it's actually a sign that they do have a frontal lobe because they are reflecting upon themselves, but it doesn't mean the frontal lobe is enhanced or working well. In fact, the way to improve suicidal thoughts is to greatly improve the frontal lobe function so that we're analyzing things appropriately and healthfully. Now notice by the time it's 12 to 17, and I'm sorry for this color, but if you could see that 12 to 17 is not accurate and uh, it has to do, uh, that 12 to 17 is, is up significantly from 6 to 11. So by the time they get to 12 to 17, you can see how it actually went through that five line there because otherwise it, wouldn't, it would be a solid line. Uh, the depression scores are significantly higher and the same for anxiety, the 12 to 17 is even above the 10 as far as anxiety. Now you can have anxiety as a child, animals can have anxiety as well. Uh, you don't need a frontal lobe to have anxiety. Uh, but you notice the older the child gets, the higher that anxiety level gets. And behavioral disorders actually start to drop after 11. Uh, we see it pretty high, three to five, even higher, six to 11, and then it drops after 11. So when did mental illness begin to skyrocket? In the United States, it was 2012. And what was significant about that year? That was when half of Americans owned a smartphone. Now in every country of the world, once half of the population owns a smartphone, you see a marked increase in depression and anxiety. Now, I was in Kenya in 2019. Kenya was known as a country that did not have depression at all. Poor country, many challenges there, economic challenges, even challenges getting enough water, but no one was depressed. They're all pretty happy uh, in, in that country. Uh, but in 2019, I went there to talk because depression and anxiety rates were skyrocketing and the national newspaper had a big headline depression and anxiety and suicide dramatically increasing in Kenya. The next day, the headline said, shock, depression and anxiety linked to smartphone usage. And they mentioned in 2019, over half of Kenyans now owned a smartphone. So what is it about this? And by the way, it increases further after that. Once you get the whole population on a smartphone, you can imagine that uh, it's going to increase further if indeed there is a cause and effect relationship. Now, these statistics that I've been talking about were prior to the COVID pandemic, which started in 2020. What do you think happened to mental health and emotional wellness during the pandemic? Did it get better or did it get worse? <laughs> It got worse. Now, the media was focused in on the COVID pandemic, but it turns out there was another pandemic that was even more significant sweeping the world. What was that pandemic? It was the mental illness pandemic. And the studies have shown, and the CDC has not yet come out, they're really analyzing the data and crunching the numbers, but the studies are showing that mental illness went up at least by 25%. Uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, in fact, some of the high school students during the COVID pandemic, we talked about 18.8% seriously considering suicide. It was like 50% in some of the studies seriously considering suicide. Now, of course, were they using their screens more or less during COVID? They were told that they couldn't have face-to-face -face social interaction. They had to get on screens. Uh, because otherwise grandma or grandpa would die uh, if they didn't and they caught something, et cetera. So a major longitudinal study looked at the lives of more than a million young people. Teens who spend large amounts of time glued to phone and computer screens are markedly more happy or less happy? Less happy than those who prefer what? Real world activities and interactions. Social media, texting, Video chatting, 
multi-platform video games, all associated with what? Decreased happiness. Now, this is not intuitive to our young people, and I should also say it's not intuitive to our adults. This, this problem is not confined to young people, by the way. It is a problem throughout the age spectrum. In fact, we had a gentleman come to our program in his 70s, and he drove onto our campus at Weimar University where we run our depression and anxiety recovery programs in a nice, shiny Corvette and uh, some of the young people were, uh, were gagaing about this beautiful Corvette. And he comes there to the Weimar Inn to go through the program. And I asked him, I said, so why are you here? And he says, my wife made me come. She says she is divorcing me unless I come to this program. Because my mental health is causing her to have all sorts of mental health issues. By the way, mental health is one of the primary reasons why divorces occur. It's usually one or maybe both individuals that are having mental health challenges that, that bring it about. And so uh, the first lecture we give in our depression and anxiety recovery program is a lecture about technology. A little bit about what we're going to be talking about uh, in, uh, tonight a little bit. And uh, after uh, that lecture, they're all, they all have to hand in their smartphone devices. We actually take away their phones for 10 days. Now they get them back for about a half hour a day so they can communicate with their friends and relatives. Uh, but uh, uh, during the crucial parts of the program, it's not there. And of course, it's for good reason. Uh, as, we'll, uh, as we'll discuss. And uh, he turned in his phone, but he had two phones. <laughs> and a couple of days later, of course, he's late to meetings and he's having uh, significant issues and he's not sleeping well and things like that. And then, of course, we find out he has another phone. And so, uh, but he was, uh, you know, pretty uh, hardcore, just wanting to do what he wanted to do, et cetera. And so they said, uh, the counselor isn't going to work, the administrator is not going to work, Dr. Nedley, you're going to have to talk to him. So I had him come, or he was scheduled to see me that day anyways, and I said, so what did you think about that technology lecture? He said, I thought it was a great lecture. I wish all my grandkids would see that. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I said, so uh, do you think it applies to you too? He says, well, you know, probably. And I said, so uh, uh, I understand you still have a phone. He says, no, I handed in my phone. And I said, uh, yeah, but you have two phones. <laughs> he says, well, how am I going to keep up with all my stocks? Uh, and he started giving all these excuses as to why he had to have his phone. But in reality, he was sabotaging himself. <clears throat> By the way, let me go back to this. Back to the young people. You take a phone away from an older person, you, they think that you are ruining their happiness, that you're against them. You take it away from a young person, and they think tenfold that. Uh, and, uh, but yet the studies are very clear. The less they use it, the happier they are. One individual I actually saw in the emergency room, 13-year-old girl who had gotten seriously injured. She needed admitted to the hospital, and so I was admitting her to our hospital that night. But she had jumped out of a moving vehicle. Why had she done that? Because her mother reached over and took away her smartphone. And it's because of what she was on and things like that, but it's like, if I can't have my phone, then I might as well just die. They think that their life's going to be ruined <laughs> without it. And we have to remind them, after 10 days of being in our program with no phone, how much better they are. Now, there's a lot of other things that have gotten them better, but they think, when they come to the program and they give up their phone, they're going to get worse because they think their phone is self-medicating themselves for their depression and anxiety. But in reality, it is doing quite the opposite. So 
Youth who invested more time in non-screen activities, playing actual sports, reading newspapers, engaging in what type of social interactions? Face-to-face -face. Face -face social interactions, significantly happier. Life satisfaction, self-worth, and happiness of young people in the U.S. plummeted after 2012, the year when the proportion of Americans owning a smartphone rose over 50 percent. By the way, that's one of the things. I saw a little brochure about this uh, Dunbar uh, church, and it seems like every uh, night there's something to do that's face-to-face -face social interactions, <laughs> where you can actually come and play table tennis, you know? There's, that's actual, you know, we talked about playing sports. That's actually face-to-face -face social interactions, those sorts of things, and so many other types of activities. So uh, the, I think the, the more you participate in that, uh, the happier you will become. So in measuring happiness, happiest teenagers are those who use digital media less than what? One hour per day. That's the top of the happiness scale in our young people. After a daily hour of screen time, levels of unhappiness rise steadily and rather exponentially. Social media, we thought, was going to be a big boom to us socially, but it's actually shown to make us antisocial. We're attracted to social media as a means of connection, but soon virtually everyone ends up comparing far more than they connect. And comparing ourselves among ourselves is not wise, particularly in a false environment. People post what they want you to see about them, but they won't post the few seconds before that picture or the few seconds after that picture, because if, you, if they did, you wouldn't be envious of them at all. <laughs> and so it, it's very short snippets of their lives, uh, often designed to try to uh, make you envious. And of course, this is why the so one of the reasons for the social appearance anxiety, because this girl that looks so beautiful on this new post that they put up, they took a thousand pictures of themselves with different lighting, all sorts of, uh, you know, angles, et cetera, before they posted that picture. And the, her friends think, there's no way I can ever measure up to this. But they don't realize she can't even measure up to that. <laughs> there's no way she can do that. But yet this is where social media drives uh, us. We compare via a false world that actually has an semblance of looking true. And time spent with media devices cannot be re regained. Media devices waste a lot of time. The typical person spends hours a day on their media device. And that's apart from work and school activities. They keep us from doing healthy activities, spending time with our families and engaging in productive work. Children actually learn more from their devices by the time they're adults uh, from at age 18 than they do from their parents. And studies show children will trust their devices over their parents. And so uh, what the device tells them, they will go with. What their parents tell them, they're not going to go with. And of course, uh, the devices are not coming up with a very good track record as far as helping our children emotionally. <laughs> Uh, at all. In fact, if you get on there and start Googling things, uh, the technology companies are, are woeful in regards to giving accurate information to children on what's going to, and adolescents in regards to what's going to help them. And of course, part of the issue with our young people is the parents using their devices. When children are home and the parents are using their devices, then of course the children are going to get on their devices. And uh, so we need to also, as older people, model the face-to-face -face social interaction. Allowing kids free access to smartphones gives them also access to the creeps of the world, which are abundant uh, on the social media sites. And uh, so uh, in a very young age, they can go to some very creepy places uh, as a result of interacting um, with these uh, creeps that are out on the internet. Now, one of the things uh, that I was not <clears throat> intuitive about. And uh, I see my, uh, my time, I want to uh, stick to the time here today because we have another presentation as well. And so we might, uh, uh, we could actually go forward with this in the next hour with some of the things because it will play into depression. But let me just uh, uh, mention this. 
we have known for a long time that rapid scene of reference changes that take place in regular entertainment television or regular Hollywood movies suppress the frontal lobe of the brain. They increase rates of depression and anxiety. They decrease your ability to accomplish. They decrease your creativity. There's all sorts of things that they, uh, they'll double your risk of academic failure in just two years of watching movies or Hollywood TV, et cetera. So we've known about that for a while. Even when Bill Clinton was president, he gave a speech that his Hollywood supporters were very upset at when he talked about the data in regards to entertainment television and movies and, and the problems it causes. So when smartphones first came out, I did not think they would be as bad. The reason why is I thought, well, you're vegetating in front of your Hollywood TV, and within 90 seconds to three minutes, your frontal lobe does get suppressed because of the rapid scene of reference change. But here, you're going to have to be making decisions. What are you going to click next? What are you going to turn to next? And so I thought, well, frontal lobe is involved in decision making, so maybe this isn't going to be so bad. And I think that's where kind of most people were with it, thinking that this was pretty harmless. But what they didn't, and what I didn't really um, uh, look at very carefully until the data started coming out, was why are smartphones that adverse, at least the normal use of smartphones for a typical person? And it actually has to do with something else the frontal lobe does. In order to pay attention and focus on something for a long period of time, it requires the anterior cingulate gyrus of your frontal lobe. That's also the area of your frontal lobe that manages distressing emotions. So if you can't focus for long periods of time, you're not going to be able to manage distressing emotions. And so what studies have shown is, a high school kid will get on their device in order to do their homework. In fact, they're told to do this. The, the, the uh, teacher says, get online and research this out and write a paper or whatever. And so they get online to do their homework. And they're thinking, OK, maybe I can get this done in 30 minutes. Let's get online and get this done. Studies show within three minutes, the kid is no longer doing his homework. Why is that? They had full intention of getting that done. Anyone? Why didn't they continue after three minutes? They got distracted. Now, why did they get distracted? Because as soon as you're online, the engineers figure out what it is that you like. And within three minutes, it knows that this kid likes BMWs. Do they sell BMWs in Australia? They do a lot in America. So you have BMWs here made by the German uh, manufacturer. So this kid likes BMWs. And so a BMW starts to float across the screen within three minutes. And it says there's a new A15 down at your local BMW dealer. And the kid's thinking, oh, I heard about this new one that's coming out. Uh, well, let me just look and see what it is, and let's look at the details. And so you start seeing the details and start seeing a little video about it. And then, as in the, in the middle of watching that, then all of a sudden a news flash comes. Boom. Donald Trump was handcuffed and put in a New York City jail. Oh, I've got to see this. And so they click on this to see what the right says about it and then what the left says about it and the look on his face as he's being handcuffed. Uh, and then a friend of theirs realizes they're online and sends a little Snapchat. That Snapchat, if you don't look at the picture right away, you're going to lose the picture. Oh, I wonder what that friend's taking a picture of. Let's take a look here. And so they're looking at that, and then someone else comes and gives them an iMessage and texts them, and oh, yeah, there's this going on. And pretty soon, 30 minutes has passed, and the kid is now thinking, why did I get on this screen to begin with? Oh, yeah, my homework. <laughs> and so this division of attention shrinks the anterior cingulate gyrus. If we never have to pay attention for long periods of time, that area of the brain will start pruning itself and saying, you never pay attention for more than five or 10 minutes on anything. You don't even need this. 
And so it starts pruning it down, but when it prunes it down, the kid will no longer be able to manage distressing emotions. This is why taking the phone away from the 13-year-old girl, she had no ability to manage distressing emotions because she was continually getting distracted by these devices. And so <clears throat> she goes to the extreme end and says, let me just end my own life. And so in order to build this up, we have to actually use our devices far differently. And studies show we are so addicted to using them harmfully that we actually have to give them up for about six weeks. An electronic fast for six weeks will often get rid of most of childhood mental illnesses today. Uh, in fact, there's a psychiatrist down in Los Angeles. She's called Victoria Dunkley. Uh, she's become famous because she says she won't diagnose any of these diseases in young people until they give up their screens for six weeks. She'll see them back in six weeks and then they'll say, well, how can I live life without sick, you know, in school? They make me get on my devices and all that. She'll write a disability note. This child is disabled and cannot learn by screens. You have to give them printed tests, printed books, <laughs> those sorts of things. And so the teacher will have to accommodate that because of the Disabilities uh, Act. And in six weeks, this kid's brain will normalize just by taking them away. And then after that, we have to train them how to use it intelligently. By use it intelligently, you have to get rid of your push notifications. You have to get rid of <clears throat> all of these things that are going to distract yourself when you are online. And what a difference it can make. As Daniel Goldman says, one of the keys to success is a digital Sabbath. How often? We think of a Sabbath once a week. He says we need digital Sabbaths every day. When adults and kids are not distracted by devices. During that time, engaged in what type of learning? Focus learning or healthy activities. And the benefits of an electronic fast have been well documented um, uh, today. Six weeks with no screen time, removing phone applications, turning off the notifications after that, and then having that limit, spending less than an hour a day on devices outside of work, and also not within an hour of going to bed. Uh, <clears throat> using screens will actually decrease your melatonin output because of the light emitted by the screens. It doesn't happen when we read printed books. So before going to bed, read a printed book. Uh, and uh, not use a screen for at least an hour uh, before uh, going to bed. <clears throat>